Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. I know we have, I have been absent the past uh, couple weeks. Bear with me. Um, we've got a lot going on, and I'm just here to say 2020 is almost at an end. Thank God. <laughs> So um, for those that may be new, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all over the world how to use applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement with the animals in their care. Um, and we do that through our live streaming services that you can find on our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. You can also email me um, personally um, at Laura, L-A-R-A, at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. And I will eventually respond to you, no kidding. Um, <laughs> I'll respond to you pretty quick, kind of. Um, anyways, so thanks um, for your patience, bearing with me while we get through the last month of the year. Um, we've got a lot going on and I always start every episode by showing a little bit of what has happened in the past couple weeks since I've been MIA. Um, you can go to our website and find out more about what we do. Um, like I said, at the animalbehaviorcenter.com, you can also find here on our Facebook page, we're very heavy on Facebook. Um, you can find all upcoming events, which are none. Um, <laughs> so we are having an event and you will not find it here. Because I haven't put it there. <laughs> um, we have the avian summit coming up at the end of January and it will be with myself, Dr. Jason Crean, Dr. Susan club, Dr. Karen Becker, um, and Bonnie Zimmerman, numerous other people. Um, if you want to find out more about that, email Jake because I forgot to put the links up. No, I'll get it up here on the events page. So Karen, if you're watching, can you put that on our <laughs> events page, please? <laughs> um, you also, um, you'll notice that our email newsletters are going out regularly again. And this live stream with Dr. Deb Jones and the awesome um, Amanda Hughes. I was like, what's her last name? I know. She just got it's married okay. last week. I was Let like, me strat. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll be going out in an upcoming email newsletter and you can find that link right here on our Facebook page. Um, and then, um, yeah, I guess before I get started, a couple of videos and photos of some things that were happening here. Um, if you want to find out more about the services we do, we live stream our work. Um, species specific and um, behavior specific, specific um, using applied behavior analysis. And applied behavior analysis is, um, yeah, we focus on B.F. Skinner's laws of behavior and how it applies to the animals in our care. So let's give you some updates. So this is what's getting ready to happen in our level two membership. Um, and today I'm going to show Amanda how I'm doing this. We are training all of our sloths to get on a scale and we have six, right? Yes. Yep. So obviously I haven't weighed them all. Um, we've only got three and they can move a lot faster than what you think. Um, so this is our baby sloth. Yes. We've not named. Well, we named it, but we're going to really have to read. We were calling him because we thought it was a boy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we were calling him Gus Gus. Obviously, we don't know how to sex sloth. I, it's a lot. It's hard. <laughs> it's a hard thing to do. We can tell so-called Gus Gus. I mean, they don't know the difference. Um, so we are going to start live streaming our training of the sloths in our level two membership. We are also, we're live streaming a lot in our level two. Um, let's see. What else are we working on? We've got Titus. Uh, Brittany knows I'm an alligator fan. This is Titus. Uh, he's probably one and a half years old. Uh, the American alligator that was surrendered to us from uh, Humane Society. Mm -hmm. Was it Toledo? I don't know. I don't know, actually. Was Humane Society. So this kind of fits into the topic of our discussion today, yeah. why animals uh, don't make good Christmas gifts, because this may have been a Christmas gift really from a year ago. Yeah. Um, and it was so sad to see this baby gator come here because I'm like, wow, you already lost your home and you're not even really big enough to be a nuisance yet. Um, so, but 
he's here. I love training alligators. So here's baby Titus. Um, and we're also working with numerous different things. Uh, this was last weekend in the office. I was sitting here working with Sahara trying I say, I don't to know get some work done. done. And this is her in my book bag. Um, so, um, yeah, I was just going to say all of this, we're live streaming a lot. Like I'm starting to live stream the turtles training. Um, we also have podcasts in our membership. Um, the, the members really love our podcast. And this week I will be uploading my um, interview with Dr. Evelyn Gould, um, who is a um, psychologist out of Harvard Medical Center. Um, and we're talking about anxiety. So anyways, I know I haven't updated anybody on our move. We are moving. Our building has kind of was been put on hold for a little bit mm -hmm. and it is now on the move. And I was told this still might happen by the end of the year. Really? Yeah. That's a little surprising. But I know cool. what we have like a week and a half left of this year. Yeah. It's what? The 20th? <laughs> I don't even know how many days. We have 31 days. 31 days. Yeah. Because yeah. New Year's Eve. So <laughs> anyways, um, our heat goes in next week. And once our heat goes in and the walls are finished, our animals move in. So I do get to see my own animals very rarely, but I'm going to show this video of sweet baby Rico, Rico. saying good night. So I do get to slip out and see them after the sunset sometimes. So he's like, good night, night. Hey, But I had to record this for Lindsay because she's like, I swear I never, I never, and there's Rocky, hear Rico talk, and um, there he is saying, go night, 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 and then he whines because he doesn't want me to leave. Um, but anyways, um, let's go ahead and get this topic started. Deb, you ready to come on? Um, <laughs> of course you sound ready. <laughs> yeah, do I sound ready? Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Um, yeah, mornings are not my best. Like that's my best time of day here, but I'm powering through with some eggnog laced coffee. Ooh. Oh, bring it over. Yeah, yeah. For um, survive. Yeah. So. Deb, thanks for joining us. Uh, jo you're a returning guest on our Coffee with the Critters. This has got to be about your fifth or sixth time, don't yes, you think? Yeah, it's been a little while, though. I've missed you. I haven't seen you for ages. So I know. Good to be back here. Yeah. Talking to people. Good. Yeah. So okay. everybody that doesn't know Deb, um, Deb Jones is a psychologist, retired professor from mm -hmm. Kent State University. Yeah, I know. The retired you part is important. Yeah, you've been <laughs> Really focusing on that retirement for quite a while. Yes, I have. I enjoy being retired. That doesn't mean not working. It means. Uh, <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I, I said, to, yeah. I said to my granddaughter, "This is not. This is not my fake retirement. This is not my real retirement yet." <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're ever. Yeah. I don't think when you love what you do, you never retire. Exactly. It was. It's like, why would I? Why well, I love working with animals. I love working with people and their animals. I'm still fascinated by it. The day that I get sick of it, then I'll retire. Yeah. <laughs> but I have a feeling it's been 25, 30 years. I'm not tired of it yet. So. Well, I know when yeah. you retired, which was a year ago this summer, right? That's been like two or three years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where have you been? Yeah. I, no, I, it's been I, guess, I, I don't know. Three, to three years. I can't remember. I can't even remember exactly how many, but it's been at least a couple. Okay. Well, two, three, yeah. Same to me. But I know yeah. since you retired, you had said, wow, I'm working harder now than I did when I was teaching. Yes. And, and that's, that's um, when you're self employed, as you know, you can work yourself constantly because there's always something else you want to do. There's always another project. You don't want to turn things down. You know, you're thinking ahead. And so I actually, right now for the first time, I just said, I'm just sort of taking December as easy as possible. And I'm going to stop doing things, you know, take a little pause 
and reset and come back next year. And hopefully next year, everything will be better. So that's, um, this is the first time I've actually felt like I've just, I'm just taking a breather and doing the bare minimum on things until January. And then I'll, I have, I have ideas, but I'm trying not to work. <laughs> Good. Not to work. Yeah. Good. It, it, I mean, it used to be where I would take every December off, which just meant I only work one full time instead. Of, I only work 40 hours a week instead of seven days. Exactly. exactly. It's uh, <laughs> craziness. Yeah. We work too much when we work for ourselves, I think, especially when you like what you do and you don't want to turn down opportunities to yep. do it. But that's, that's setting those boundaries. Not always. Well, and I didn't finish introducing you, and I want to introduce oh, Amanda, too. Um, but, Deb, you are also a professional dog trainer. You're also an instructor through Fenzie Dog Sports Academy. You also have a couple of books out. Um, and you focus – no, I'll, I'm not going to say you focus on – you're very good at what you do. <laughs> well, thank you. Um a couple different places that people can find you and I'll put this up throughout the, okay. throughout the episode is canine in focus.com. Yeah. That's kind of my main general website. Okay. And you're an instructor online at Fenzie dog sports Academy. Mm -hmm. That's where I do basically all of my online work now. Okay. And before I introduce Amanda, um, what is this? Oh, cooperative care certificate. That was my newest project for this last year. Um, and that focuses on for dogs right now, um, husbandry training for grooming and veterinary care. So that website is specific to the training that you can do to make all of that easier for your dog, all of the physical handling. And you can actually earn three levels of certificates um, with 10 exercises each. And if you go on the website, it, it sort of leads you through all of these things that you can take a look at. Um, a lot of dog owners, um, and especially people who've, who've done um, sports, dog sports and activities, like to earn titles. They like to earn certificates. So we set up the program basically so it leads you through the progressions that you would need in order to make your dog comfortable with physical care. Awesome. So that's and that's what I'm sort of, I worked hard on that last year. So that's one of the things I'm now taking a little break on. Good, good. I'll have to go take a look at it. I remember you talking about it. Yeah. And it was, I would say, um, I would definitely give you credit for my thinking on this because seeing all the work that you do regularly with all the different species of animals, just for their basic general handling and care, got me to thinking about the fact that we don't do that enough with dogs. And that we take for granted that you just grab the dog and do whatever you want to do to them. And most dogs are like, okay, whatever. But some dogs are like, oh, no, this is not going to happen. And then we have a problem. So I, I set it up a lot more along the lines of, of how you approach doing all that sort of work with your animals, um, which is new for dog, dog owners and even some dog trainers. Well, yeah, some of the um, animals I work with at the Animal Behavior Center, some of the animals we work with here at Indian Creek Zoo, um, they're not not—they're not going to be like, oh, okay. Uh, no. <laughs> they're going to be like, <laughs> death upon you. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And if you can still take care of them with protective contact or no contact, then why are we making things so hard for dogs? Um, that are living with us in our homes. We should we should be planning this and working at it a little more carefully. So that's been something that that I feel pretty strongly about, obviously, and that I've spent a lot of time trying to help people understand how you can go about training these things and how you can get started. Um, because people often jump in way down the line, like I'm going to cut my dog's nails, and my dog's like, "You're not even going to touch me." And so, how do we start? My my front leg. How are you going to clip my exactly. neck? Exactly. Yeah. And people were like, well, I don't know what to do. And so that's, that's the goal of, of that website is to start pushing people in the right direction to give them some good resources and, you know, get them on the right track. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping in and you haven't even um, introduced Amanda. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Oh, oh Amanda. Uh, <laughs> when we start talking, we always get off track and carried away very quickly. Yeah, no. I don't well, have any fancy things. So. I asked, like, I'm sitting here thinking, I was like, okay, who I wanted to, like Eva, she's on here. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. I saw her in here. She's like, where? She asked me a couple weeks ago, where can I find information on uh, the topic of why animals don't make good Christmas presents? 
Um, and I was just like, I know I covered this topic a couple of years ago on the critters and I was like, let's mm -hmm. do it again. So I'm like, who I, I wanted to get you to help me cover the companion dog or working dog. Uh, yeah. since that's in primarily everybody's home. And then I asked Amanda mm -hmm. because I was like, I listen to a lot of what Amanda says um, here at the zoo. <laughs> I say a lot. Mm -hmm. um, because you're doing the sloth encounters, the lemur encounters, and people mm -hmm. want to get up close with these animals and they're like, <gasps> how many times have we been in a lemur encounter and we hear somebody go, I want a lemur. And I'm like, no, you don't. Almost every encounter, no, somebody wants to take an animal home. And I'm like, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. So let me introduce Amanda um, before we get started on this topic. So Amanda works with me really closely here at Indian Creek Zoo, helping me train along with Lindsay Douglas, um, helping me train and focus on, we're focusing on, on enrichment programs, species specific enrichment programs here at the zoo. And every single one of them include training. So yes, Amanda, would you tell us a little bit about your um, My education? education? Well, I studied biology and environmental science, um, but when people ask me well, how I got into this, I always say I've been doing this for the last 15 years. Um, I'm 31, and I, when I was 15 years old, I started volunteering at our other local zoo because I knew that I wanted to work with animals. Um, and I was there for about eight years leading up into college um, I, where I studied biology and environmental science, but I was also working at a science center that focused on taking care of animals, but then also having those animals available to do education for anywhere from pre-K up to nursing homes. And that was another great example of where I would bring out animals and like bunnies and guinea pigs and baby talking. alligators, baby, yeah. <laughs> and birds and all kinds of stuff. And um, talking about where they lived and everything, but also talking about why they don't necessarily make good pets. Um, and then uh, through college, I worked there and then also for a vet. Um, so I was like nodding my head when we were talking about dogs because I worked a lot in managing a doggy daycare. Um, and so I saw a lot where people jump right in um, and don't do any research to the dog that they get. Um, and then after college, I knew that I wanted to go back into the zoo world because this is my passion, uh, to do training, education, um, enrichment and so i have been here for almost two years the first year i was here i was mostly just working with large animals and now i work with you which is <laughs> which, <laughs> i love working with all the animals but this is my passion that doing caring for animals but also doing the enrichment the education the training making sure that the animals are doing more than just surviving in zoos but actually thriving in zoos is something i'm really passionate about and then you know, our zoo here is really a great opportunity for kids, especially to get close to animals and learn um, in a different way. It's very different for them to see a sloth in a book or see a sloth in person. And we were just talking yesterday about what we're going to do this summer with the sloths. So the training yeah. is ready to start. I'm excited. Yeah. So with that being said, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about why um, animals don't make good Christmas gifts. And I thought it was just the perfect time since it was the Sunday before Christmas. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> close the door for <laughs> we have a Dimozel crane in here. So if it becomes, he's a bit of a loud mouth. Yeah. Um, nah, fine. Okay. Sounds like a dinosaur. <laughs> um, so wanted to bring up the reason why they don't make good pets. And I didn't give this any forethought. The last time I did this episode, I had the top 10 reasons, and I'm trying to remember what they were, but. Um, we might stumble on a few of them if we talk about it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one, yeah. one I want to bring up um, is one topic, a point I want to bring up is that um, it sounds, yeah, it'll be a great a surprise. And it'd probably mm -hmm. be one that your kid will never forget until mm -hmm. Christmas day passes and New Year's Eve passes and mm -hmm. everybody goes back to work. The excitement wears off. And that puppy mm -hmm. chewing on the couch and peeing on the carpet and now it's a problem. It is a huge problem. It's like, yeah, giving a gift of an animal is, we, we tend to say it's never a good idea. <laughs> um, it's really, you don't want to, you want to make sure, first of all, that the person wants the animal and that if you're giving them to a kid, for example, don't expect that kid's going to take care of that animal in any way. And it's still going to need 
um, all the work and all the training and all the follow up that people don't think about. They just think about the excitement of the moment. And I get that. It's really exciting um, to get a puppy. Um, but that means that when I get a puppy and I'm thinking about getting a puppy, so I'm going to get a puppy. I saw that the other day. I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's time. But I've been thinking about it for a long time. Yeah. And I'm getting a puppy in the spring. And I'm getting a puppy in the spring for one really, really important reason. Um, because we both live in Ohio, typically, though I'm in Asheville right now, but we both live in Ohio. I don't want a winter puppy. The last thing in the world I want is to try to house train a puppy in the cold in the snow. It's miserable. It's absolutely miserable. It's hard enough to house train anyway. If you live someplace where your winters are cold and this time of year is cold, it's the absolute worst time to try to house train a puppy because I'm outside every half hour to 45 minutes with my puppies for the first three to four months that I have them. Um, so that's one thing to be prepared for. It's like, are you ready to dedicate the next three to four months to house training your puppy? And for, for most people, the answer is no. No, they're, they're gonna be working full time. They've got kids to take care of. They've got other things going on. So I think about when I'm gonna have that chunk of time that I can dedicate to them and what the weather's going to be like, because I have made the mistake of getting winter puppies and I will never do that again. Um, we got one on January 1st and I think we had about three feet of snow on the ground. And it's like, no, this is miserable in so many ways. So, so that's my, my first reason. <laughs> yep. I did that with Levi and snow. We almost called Levi tundra because it was the year <laughs> of where we had the negative 42. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, when, yeah. And I was just yeah. outside. I'm going, wow, you can't even move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad I got both of my yeah. <laughs> And it's hard enough to house train um, an, an animal anyway. It's hard enough to house train a dog. Um, and I'm very dedicated to it because I always say if you work hard at it for like the first three months or so, then you have 15 years where you're home free where you don't have problems. But if you don't work on it hard in the beginning, it's one of those things that's just a consistent issue. Yep. And nobody wants their animal going to the bathroom in their home. So you've got that Christmas puppy and now it's next June and you still don't have them house trained. And one, the longer that goes on, the, the less likely you're ever gonna actually fix that problem, which is why a lot of dogs lose their homes. And um, that's the last thing we want is for them to end up being, you know, sent elsewhere because usually that doesn't end well for anybody. So better to think about, do I have a lot of consistent time for the next three to four months? Not only for house training, but for all the other things that are, all the other types of training that are going to be necessary. There's a lot that you can do in those first few months to ensure that your puppy is going to be happy and healthy and well socialized. Again, I want to take my puppy out places and get them out in the world so they can see things when they're young. Um, we talk about critical periods of development um, where they really need to see the world and the, especially the parts of the world they're going to be spending their lives in. So if you never take them out of the house because it's too cold and unpleasant to go anywhere and then you get to spring, and you go, oh, well, we're going to go to the park now. And either they're scared of everything or they're barking frantically at everything because they've never seen these things before. You let the critical period pass when you could have exposed them to things and they would be comfortable. And now you're going to have, again, sometimes a lifetime of work trying to get them comfortable in the world. And often that ends up with, well, we just don't take them out anywhere ever. So you've got an animal that never leaves home. Then you have a fearful, unsocialized animal. Right. Um, and that's the last thing we want as well. That's, again, why I think about spring, <laughs> wherever you happen to live, because I think spring is a much better time to be able to get out and about. And it's, I mean, it's somewhat a lot of similarities with us when like look at we've got um sahara, sahara the baby serval mm -hmm. uh we've got another baby don't we we have some babies somewhere we've got the baby gator um these animals are going to be education animals we mm -hmm. need to expose them now so mm -hmm. they're going to be um exposed to a large amount of people all at once and kids hands wanting to come mm -hmm. um so we've got to we get being out yeah we, come here Come here. Come here. No. Touch. 
He's like, no, I'll take a Dorito. What have you got there? What are you talking to? Oh, oh um, let's see. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my gosh, he's cute. Oh, he's looking at you. Um, <laughs> he's so, he's such a cool bird. Um, he um, is an education crane. And when the zoo is open, he's usually out in the gift shop, walking around, just walk in and people are like, whoa, whoa he's a part of the gift shop crew. Because yeah, people. but like, <laughs> I mean, he needs to be exposed. Um, mm -hmm. We try that every time he gets out of his enclosure, he has to have his harness on. So he's pairing the harness with being out, which is where he wants to be. So yeah. he's looking yes. forward. Um, those conditioned reinforcers to he sees the harness and he's like, going out, going out. So we didn't get a lot of time to, and this is, Similar to what you're talking about, Deb. We didn't get a lot of time to take him out. Mm -hmm. yeah. We got him this year, but we didn't get a lot of time to take him out. So what we're doing, because we can't get him outside, especially right now in these temps, what we can do is expose him continuously to something new. Boom. Here it yeah. is. Boom. Here yeah. it is. Reinforce mm -hmm. call. Um, right? Right. Um, yeah. So uh, that way... Like if you're stuck with your animal in the house during the winter, you can still train them, expose them to new sounds, new objects, big things going over their head. That's something that's mm -hmm. a change. Um, if you feel you're confined to not being able to do more social outings. Especially right now. Yeah. 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 Right. And there is. If you, if you miss that time frame when they're young, you, you can't necessarily make it up later on. You can try, but honestly, I've seen over and over again where, you know, once an animal has gotten used to life being very predictable and nothing changing, then change is frightening. And so then we've got, all, um, you know, we've got a question, well, if, if is this in their best interest? If I'm just scaring them all the time, no, it's not in their best interest. So it's so much better to get them out while they're still not ready to be afraid of things. You know, part of that's temperament, but another part of it is socializing them and just exposing them to the world, just getting them out and seeing new things all the time, which is harder if, if you're going through like we do in Ohio, January and February, that's prime time. You know, if you've got a Christmas puppy, yet you can't really do the things you need to do um, to ensure that I'm always I'm thinking for about the first year, I have to lay a really strong foundation so that I have a good dog for 15 years. And so I need to be thinking about that arc of time. What am I going to do in that first year? And a big part of those first the first month is I'm going to bond with them. You know, then the next few months are I'm going to let them see as much of the world as I can let them see in a very safe way so that they're comfortable with all kinds of change and new things happening. And then I start thinking about all the specific things I'm going to be training them to do from, you know, as well. Um, but that's that's all to think about. Yep. And if you are really dedicated to getting a Christmas puppy, that's great. But then you have to be dedicated to the next year. Of, of making sure that puppy just isn't going to magically become a wonderful dog just because you love them. That's not enough. This is one of those love is not enough things. You also have to do the right things for them along the way. So, so that, there's a that planning that needs to go into this that most people do right. not do. And those right. are the people that are keeping the shelters very full. They are. And there's a couple things that go on around the holidays. Uh, many breeders will not sell dogs around the holidays just because they've seen that this is an issue, that it's more of an impulse buy than a really thoughtful, educated buy. So a lot of, uh, of breeders are very careful about not selling. So then where are you gonna find a puppy? Probably from a not great source. And then we have issues with genetics, both in temperament and health. Um, because again, I'm, I've been planning ahead for a long time for looking at my next puppy and looking at those kinds of things, you know, looking at the genetics of it, looking at the parents um, to make sure that they're healthy and well adjusted. And when you go buy a puppy from a lot of sources, you don't have any idea. You're just, you know, you're just getting a puppy because it's available. And right. so that's what happens a lot at the holidays is if you take what's available, and even if it's a cute puppy, doesn't necessarily mean it's a healthy puppy or that its personality is going to be a, um, a strong and healthy one as it grows up and becomes an adult. 
So we're kind of pulled in by this image of this cute little puppy, which we all are. <laughs> we all right. love the cute puppy and we want to grab them and hug them <laughs> and, and, and take them home. But that can become really problematic um, when it's that impulse purchase. And then we find out that what we've got might not be what we were expecting at all. You know? We so see that a lot here. Like we have oh, babies. We have the baby marmosets. I mean, we get all kinds of, but there's the same, oh. even like Easter time, it's a little different holiday, but like we always end up with here at the zoo, a bunch of rabbits. All of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. After, um, ducks. 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 Sometimes chickens. Um, a lot of bunnies. A lot of our bunnies came to us because they get them for their kids. And then they're like, oh, my kids weren't interested anymore. So here. Yeah. We yeah. have. We get a lot of people um, call the zoo wanting to surrender mm -hmm. tortoises, uh, parrots. Yes, uh, you get a lot of bird requests. Yep, a lot of yeah. yep. Yeah. Almost yeah, and all of our parrots, minus the hyacinths, are, are surrenders. Here, yeah, are surrenders. Yeah, yeah. I can, and there's not enough homes. There's not enough yeah. places for them. Plus, usually, then these animals, as they've gotten a little bit older, have some behavior problems. So now it's even harder to find somebody who can take care of them and to help them work through whatever their problems happen to be. Um, you know, nobody wants the eight month old dog that's jumping on you and grabbing at your clothes. They want the cute little puppy, you know, with the big eyes. So that's problematic that, you know, now you've gotten to the point where this animal is no longer <clears throat> appealing to people who might want it. And now you're trying to find a home for it. And that's difficult to impossible to, to do a well, lot of times. And when you start to get into the world of exotic animals and mm. as pets, um, your reptiles, your birds, your, your small different birds, primate. your primates. I yeah. mean, I was some sites yesterday where they're selling primates and I'm just like, I'm telling you, <laughs> Don't do it. I, mean, actually, I was trying to convince the girl on my sloth encounter yesterday not to get a she wants capuchin and I was like no you don't no no you don't mm -hmm. you do not want a primate so you go buy it and surrender it and to then me you're in gonna, about yeah. a year and I understand mm -hmm. and in her heart she thought I could provide it and that's I talk about this a lot in encounters I understand a lot of people in their heart think that they can do the best for that animal and mm -hmm. I mean some of them could um but I talk about how expensive it is and how even zoos have trouble trying to care for all of these exotic animals that it's not this cute little thing right. for like the marmosets. They're super cute right now, oh. but they're going to require <laughs> us to do a lot of training to not have them. They're starting to get to that age now where they're getting a little more nibbly. They're getting, so they're super cute for, you know, what, a couple <laughs> months. Yeah. They so came like, this, big, this big and they're looking they're at you cool. like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Every single person that sees them is like, oh, oh yeah. my God, that's so cute. I need, I need mm -hmm. to have one. And I'm like, why don't you come volunteer for yeah. a little bit? Open up that cage and <laughs> open up yeah. that enclosure and change the yeah. bottom. Tell me what the first thing is you smell. Oh, it smells. Oh, Tell me what the first thing <laughs> is you see. Yeah. Next thing you know, mm -hmm. there is like last week, I was telling her, I was like, <laughs> I opened up the door to get them on the scale and I put my arm out like this and the one comes up and goes <laughs> like corn on the top. Wait, my ear, yes. <laughs> what are you doing? Wait, yeah, they're also, and that's the thing, they're so cute. All baby animals are cute. Yeah. I mean, there's no question. They've got those little neotenous features like the big eyes and, and they just look at you and you're like, I could, I could love you. I, I love you already. I don't even know you, but I love you. Um, and so therefore, somehow you could come and live with me and it'll all work out perfectly. And we know, we know that that's just totally unrealistic. But people don't think so. They think that their that their situation is the exception to the rule, yeah. and that everything's going to work out great. You know, and every time I see a species or an animal that I want, I try to think about what's it going to be like in a year, um, because a year goes by awfully darn fast. Well, and you know. and, at, and at our age, the older you get, um, mm -hmm. pending, you got to think of where am I going to be in fifteen years? Oh, right. Right. Longer with your birds. I mean, what you're talking, yeah. they're going to outlive me. I, I mean, I couldn't possibly get a large bird now because it would outlive me yeah. so much. Rico, but I think I do think about it with dogs because I think 15 years, which is generous. 
for most breeds of dogs, actually. We don't get 15 out of a lot anymore. But I think in that, in those terms, I'm like, okay, so I'm this age now. You know, if I live for this dog's entire life, this is how old I'm going to be. Is that smart to do? Um, is that a smart thing to take on? So it's, it's something to, to seriously think about. I was just with, um, when I worked at a vet. I was just saying when I worked at a vet, um, I would see so many cases of people of older disposition buying puppies. Mm -hmm. yeah, buying puppies. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you can't. <laughs> You can't handle a puppy like buying doodle puppies because mm -hmm. doodles and daycare are, take up at least 50 percent of the population because they're just people buy them because they're cute and they're hyperallergenic and don't take any consideration to the fact that they're a very hyper breed they can be very hyper breed mm -hmm. I see it all the time I'm like go buy a little if you want to really get a dog get something that's maybe a little bit smaller a little or older a lot of senior dogs need homes but they get puppies mm -hmm. and then they, uh, you know us and they're like help me and i'm like maybe you shouldn't have got a puppy <laughs> i don't and, and one of the reasons like i mean i i love dogs i have three um but my heart is with exotics yeah. my heart is in exotics mm -hmm. and um deb i know you can feel my pain here um <laughs> one of the very last in-home dog consultations i took and i knew i didn't want to take it <laughs> he called me and he was begging me and I said, I'm going to regret this. Okay, I'll be over. So I walked in and it was a 68-year-old um, man with health conditions that moved up here from Florida to take care of his elderly pa parents and decided to get a, a puppy giant schnauzer. Oh, okay. And I said, and what made you make this decision? And he mm -hmm. goes, well, because I had one before. Um, and I was like, okay, and do the math, minus 15 years. And, mm -hmm. he goes, and I'm just finding out that he's just like, this thing just has a lot of energy. And I was like, well, 15 years ago, you probably had a lot more energy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because they're going to have needs that we have to meet. And that, again, you don't often think about. So you talk about um, grooming, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, can you afford, can you do it yourself or can you afford to pay somebody to do it um, regularly for the next 15 years or however long it takes? Um, and I, um, I thought, I think carefully about, yeah, can I, what about their exercise needs? Because we know if an animal doesn't get the right enough exercise, that's a big cause of some of the behavior problems that we see. So can I exercise this animal? Now, there are no guarantees. You know, a young person could find out that they're incapable of managing a high energy animal at any point in time. But when you're 70, <laughs> you know, it's pretty clear that you probably don't want that, you know, Labrador retriever puppy. That maybe you would leave that for somebody who's more active because you're not going to be as active in the future. Well, possibly. I know there are exceptions to every rule, trust me, but but I think in general we don't think about that. Um, we also don't think about, um, Amanda mentioned the vet care, and especially now that for most vets, at least around here, you can't go in with your animal. Mm -hmm. um, they're still doing the curbside service. So you get a puppy, your vet's taking them away from you in you don't know what's happening in there you don't know what kind of experience they're having and to me that's a huge deal um that's a really really big deal because i do so much training to make sure that all of their physical care is um pleasant and comfortable for them so i don't want to send them away with somebody that i don't know unless i'm absolutely forced to um so i i think about that um, because setting those early, those early experiences set the stage for how they approach it for the rest of their lives. So at some point, COVID will be over, we'll be going back in places face to face with people. But by then my puppy will may have decided that they don't like the vet's office. And I'm going to fight that fight for another 12, 15 years, whatever it happens to be. And so that's something I, I trust my vet completely. And I know, and you know, we've worked together for years. And so I, I'm not too concerned but at the same time, things happen. Yeah. So, think um, about. And another thing is um, a lot of, I put a lot of time and work in, um, in my education into training an animal to get ready for a vet visit. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people are just used to 
manhandling the animal. Yeah. And I'm like, mm -hmm. whoa, stop. Yeah. Do not even think about touching this animal like that. You are getting ready to positively punish this animal's behavior of looking forward to going to the veterinarian when I put all this work into it. Exactly. Um, exactly. Do not have yeah. to this animal do, do yeah. anything. I can get it to get into position by putting your nose to a yeah. to a hand target, um, tar doing a, a a head hold while you inspect the body and um, you don't have to put your arm around its neck like this to give it an injection, just give it the injection because I've trained it for that. Right, exactly. And that's what I really work towards too. Um, and that can all be ruined in one bad experience. Most veterinarians are not as versed in behavior as I would hope they would be. And they are often in a time crunch to get things done. Most vet techs, um, while I really admire the hard work they do, because it's hard work, um, they're not always well trained in how to deal with animals, especially fearful animals. And you can make it worse very fast. Yeah. And so I, I'm very careful in my early vet visits with my puppies. Um, to think about, you know, how we're going to approach this, how we're going to make it a good thing, you know, how comfortable we're going to make it. I often do a lot of visits, just well puppy, just go in and out and maybe get weighed and, you know, we don't do anything unpleasant as much as possible. And that, that's harder to do now. Um, but that's something to think about as well, is if you're, if you're going to be getting a puppy, you're going to start setting the stage for how they feel about these things right away. And I would like that to be better. I would like that to be good, if at all possible. Um, so I would put it off a little while. Um, but And think about, like I say, all those things they need. They're going to need grooming. That's another place where we get into the same problem if you send them to a groomer. Um, that they the groomer just wants to get it done. And I understand that. They've got a job to do. They've got time. Time um, crunch. But in doing that, they can often end up having some bad experiences that I have literally seen take the dog's almost entire lifetime to overcome. <laughs> yes. Um, and, yeah, you know, I like to put the time. And I have seen different vets, too, that are phenomenal that sit oh, down, yeah. yes. get down on the ground oh. and... Um, like my sister the other day had the vet come to her house and she said, Laura, it was the most awesome experience. She goes, the vet, the vet tech got on the ground and mm -hmm. Scarlett got all her shots and all she was focused on was the treat and not one sign of being nervous. Mm -hmm. I'm really picky about who my dogs see because yeah, I don't, want, yeah, I don't yeah. want my dogs to be scared and they're not going to be me. I don't want them to be manhandled during the, yeah, no, because I've seen both sides. I purposely left a vet to go to a different one because it did not like the way he treated my dogs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think people have done that. And then sometimes we run into the case where you have no choice. Um, yeah. Like when star ate this corn cob last summer <laughs> out of the blue um, and ended up at an emergency vet you know, that I never met before in a place I couldn't go into. And so I've got to hope at that point, all my training is going to hold up and pay off. Um, luckily, Partially, she was so sick, she didn't care, <laughs> I don't think, or wasn't aware of what was going on. But I do think that the training helps, um, that the training helped her get through that that situation and move on. Um, so those are things to think about with a puppy. You're going to have to get them into the vet right away. You're going to have to get them house trained. Um, if you get your puppy for a child, do not expect that child is going to be able to take care of it in any way. Just don't. That's just ridiculous. That's magical thinking on the parents' part. Yeah. There is no way it's not the parents' responsibility 1,000%. You know? If you decide to buy an animal as a gift, I would say be in the mindset that you're going to be taking care of that animal mm -hmm. for the rest of its life. You, yeah. not the one you're buying it for, you. And even in exotic well, animals, I mean, yeah. a lot of, I don't expect kids to be able to handle a lot of mm -hmm. Sometimes we can't even handle exotic animals. So no, I'm not expecting a child to be able to handle a baby alligator, you know. <laughs> now, obviously there's, there's some exceptions to the rules. There are some, you know, but still when people come into encounters and they start talking about, they want to get a lemur or they're just, because we're around exotic animals. So they start telling me about all the animals mm -hmm. they want to own and you own. I start kind of going like, oh, like I'll usually say as a keeper, I don't usually condone 
owning exotic animals, actually talking about going to the vet, it's a very expensive experience for an exotic animal to go to a vet. And to find a good vet for an exotic animal, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's much easier to find vets for dogs and cats. Um, and I hear people who struggle to find a vet, you know, a good vet for their bird or, or whatever. There are not that many. And then you're doing a lot of traveling and spending a lot of money yeah. in order to. Yeah, so usually your exotic vets are a lot more expensive, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. You're paying exotic prices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're paying for their education and expertise in that um, niche. Um, so when, like, for example, when Rico got sick, when he had his accident, <clears throat> I was shelling out the thousands. You yeah. know, it wasn't hundreds. It was thousands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's no time at all for that to add up when yeah. you've got a really, really sick animal. It's just amazing how fast. And that's another thing to think about. Could I afford, you know, um, stars, corn cob surgery and, and everything, $6,000 for three, four days. So can you afford that? Is that, you know, yeah. if you get a puppy and they eat the ornament off the Christmas tree, because that is highly possible, you know, that they do that. Can you now afford all of the surgeries that's good, that are going to follow and the, the follow up that's going to be necessary? You know, Christmas, a lot is going on. Holidays, a lot is going on in the house. A lot of weird things that are not normally happening. And so to me, that's like um, there's a lot of dangers around your house that might not normally be there from the Christmas ornaments to the poinsettias to all kinds of things that your your puppy should definitely not ingest. I mean, puppies eat wrapping paper, they eat ribbons, they eat everything. They are like little alligators running around with their mouths open all the time. And we're not, we've got a lot more stuff out on our houses, in our houses during the holidays. And so there are a lot more dangers for them and we're busy and we're distracted. So we're not paying attention to the puppy. We're paying attention to all the other things going on in the environment. They can easily get into things that they shouldn't get into, um, especially if there are kids around because your kids are gonna leave out stuff that's dangerous like chocolate. Um, and so then you're going to have to deal with, I think vets see a huge uptick in all kinds of emergency cases around the holidays because of this. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing to consider is, you know, if I get a puppy now, I've got all these other things going on because it's the holidays. Um, and I'm not really going to be able to spend a lot of time and bad things can happen very, very fast <laughs> with, with small animals, you know, running around your house. It's and a life, an accommodation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that makes me think also about um, look at the strange times we're living in right now with the pandemic, you know, um, getting a puppy. Pandemic at the puppies, time. yeah. There was pandemic puppies are everywhere because of the pandemic. Oh, I'm sure people are home, so they, more, yeah, home. People are home, so they mm -hmm. have the time. But what happens when you go back to work? Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, and something else that the pandemic, when the pandemic first hit, and people, God, do you remember how long ago was that? When we were like, months. what do you mean I have to stay home for 14 <laughs> days? I know. Now that seems so silly. It's like in 14 months, whatever. Uh, yeah, just tell and me when I can get out again. One of the things I thought of then when people were sitting here complaining about having to quarantine for 14 days you can't even you can't even get through the first three days. No. Imagine how your dog feels stuck in the house. Imagine how your bird feels stuck in the cage. When's the last time you got it out of the cage? Yeah. This isn't a pandemic for them. This is life, and that's how oh. they're going to live it. And you can't even get through three days without bitching. I know. It, when I when I discovered the biggest part of my day was taking my dogs for a walk. I mean, it's like, this is how they feel all the time. It's like going for a walk. That's a big deal. You know, we get to get out and look around. So you start, I think people start to realize, yeah, it's having that same thing and never changing routine and never having anything interesting happen in your life. That's not good for their, for their mental health at all. Um, and we need to, to think about that, that they need, that they need variety. They need change. They need something interesting to do. Um, on a daily basis, and we need to provide that for them. So, yeah, it's, it's with, to think. when working with exotics, you got to think of um, nature. This animal has evolved through millions of years to be able to fly, mm -hmm. and your energy level meets that form 
form of look emotion and you're welcome jackie thanks larry <laughs> um so you're mm -hmm. wanting to get exotic animals that swing from branches and jungles well mm -hmm. It's going to be swinging from Zero lights house, and knocking yeah. things off of cupboards. And we want to get these animals and then change their natural behavior to fit our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Monkeys it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Exactly. We can't even get cats to stop doing the things that cats do. Yeah. I can't get my cat to, you know, to stop climbing on things or knocking stuff off the tables. So what makes me think I'm going to be able to take a primate, you know, and get them to live in my world? And I think that's the thing. We want our animals to fit into our worlds. We want it to be convenient for us We're to have this close. pet. But <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, we need to think about what they need. And when you get to most of your non-domestic and exotic animals, I just can't provide for them. I'll be done. I can't give them the kind of, the kind of life they need. <clears throat> and I know that. I'm smart enough to know that. I'll leave it to somebody who, who has a lot more resources than I do. Even though I want, you know, I want like a crow so badly. I'm like, I, I could live with a crow. I would, I, and then I discover how much work it is to live with a crow. And I'm like, mm, no, maybe I don't really want a crow. I like the idea of a crow. People <laughs> very much. The, the smart animals, like the border collies and the ravens. So we brought in a crow. Everybody at the center wanted a raven because they knew how smart they were. And I was like, you get what you pay for. The smarter the animal, the harder it is to keep. So we brought in a crow just to see and i wanted all the volunteers to see if we were ready for a raven because this raven's going to be turning off light switches poking holes in the ceiling work with but understand that they are so smart yeah, yeah. yeah. and um we could barely handle the crow so we are still ravenless <laughs> And that's that's important to think about. And I mean, that's I think that's true for some in some situations. That's true for any animal. People just aren't ready for any animal um, that's going to change their lifestyle and in, in, in any way. And it's going to they're going to challenge them, you know, like on the cold days. I don't want to go out and walk, <laughs> but my dogs, my dogs need it. And so I have to do the things that I don't want to do. Um, um, oh, I, I see this comment. Yeah, there are plenty of seniors. I'm one of them. I can deal with a big dog for now, but well, I'm smart enough to also know there may be a time when I can't deal with a big, strong, active dog. So Sandy's a vet tech. Yeah. <clears throat> Sandy Hambrecht is a vet tech. Um, she's attended some of the workshops we have here at the Animal Behavior Center, but she brought her bringing up that some seniors can handle it made mm -hmm. me think of something which might be relevant to all people, all species that you're allowed to purchase and keep in houses or homes. Um, no matter what your age, if you're 80 or if you're five, whether you want a puppy or a capuchin monkey, be a foster. Be a foster or go volunteer Yeah, and mm -hmm. make sure you really want that. Yeah. Right. Foster, yeah. You can foster it for, yeah. and then if, if it doesn't work out, it can go back to the rescue. If it does work out, you'll be a foster failure. Come volunteer at the zoo and see how much work we actually go into cleaning, enrichment, training. See how much that you know. It's not pretty. It's it's can be <laughs> and not fun and dangerous sometimes. But yeah, like these are things that we as a zoo have to constantly worry about. Um, I was just gonna say that during our lemur encounters, we're talking about how smart primates are. People see how cute the lemurs are, and they have their little hands, and they're being you know they're feeding them. And I said, these guys are actually really, really smart. Primates in general are really, really smart. You're going to have to really be thinking about how do I keep them from getting bored? Like that is a job just itself. So mm -hmm. a lot of people don't want to put the time into that. And I like a lot of times during lemur encounters, they're like, oh, I want one mm -hmm. so bad. And I was like, oh, look what she's doing with her butt. And she's <laughs> she's going to do that on your refrigerator. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They rub their glands all over the, the they rub wall. their butt up on stuff. <laughs> there's a lot, yeah. There's a lot of the ugliness under the surface there of things that, especially primates, want to do on a regular basis that uh, we probably don't really think we want to live with. So I think being realistic, um, and I know when I'd spend time with you and your animals, uh, that convinced me I didn't want a bird. I'm like, I like them. I think they're awesome. They're fun to work with, but I. 
on the day-to-day -day basis, I can't live with this. I can't do what is necessary. And thinking about, you know, the kind of life I want to live and, and my lifestyle, I want to travel and I, and I like to do, you know, things, I like to be free to do things when I want to do them. And so that's not always possible. Um, and even with dogs, you have to think about that. If I want to travel and I want to, and I'm going to be busy, what am I going to be doing with this animal? And if the answer right. is just, oh, I leave them home all the time, that's probably not a good answer. Probably not a good, you know, thing to do. It's hard to find a friend to take care of your monkey while you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's hard enough to find a good dog sitter that I trust. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. who comes into my house and takes care of my animals, and so yeah finding somebody to take care of your exotic animals is Mom, going to be... will you take care of my alligator while I go <laughs> on vacation? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just have to toss it a... Oh, I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Grab the mice from the refrigerator and toss it over that cup. Yep. Yeah, uh, don't... I still remember you saying, don't drink out of that cup. <laughs> and I'm like, why? Uh, mouse parts. That came over one day. And then I'm like, I'm never drinking out of a cup in your house ever again. <laughs> I, told, I told her, I said, don't ever walk around here and just pick up a cup no. and think you're going to drink out of it. Because no. she walks yeah. in, she walked into the center and she was like, oh, what's it? Oh, God, there was a mouse. In there. <laughs> oh, there's um, mice, there's bugs, there's yep. poop. Yeah. There's, yep. Yep. There's, there's, there's a lot of ugly parts to taking care of animals. I mean, there's the, but we... We have to take that along with, you know, the fact that they're cute and they're fun and, and there's a lot of value in having animals in your life. I certainly wouldn't th say there isn't. I think there's a ton of value in having a lot of different animals and, and working with them. I love working with different species. I just don't want to live with different species. <laughs> it's like I want to work with them and then go home and take a shower and not have to think about them again until I feel like working with them again. Yeah. That's what one great one of many great things of working at this zoo is you want everything and you can see it, but you don't have to feed it. You don't have to. Well, you do have to take care of it. <laughs> you, have to get, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do but the I get vet to go home and You get to go home and come back the next day. I don't have to. Yeah. There's a reason that even I don't have exotic animals at home other than a fish, a guinea pig, and two dogs. I don't want to go home to exotics. It's, uh, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of work to do enough of it here. I don't want to go home and take care of another exotic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get that. Um, and somebody's saying here about treating and baby animals like human babies. And I think that's a really important point, Ray, saying, um, yeah, yeah, the mistake. And that's a huge mistake. And I understand it um, from the point of we love them and we feel like almost feel like they are a family, but we're doing them a huge disservice if we don't understand their basic nature and what they truly are and what they need, they don't need us to hug them. Typically, most animals don't like being hugged, even dogs. Yes, so we don't I was just gonna but, say, yeah. you know, I stop doing that. it. You're doing it because we want to, not because it's good for them. And yeah. that's one of my primary thoughts is always, is this good for this animal? Is this something that's that's going to add to their life in some way. And if the answer is no, like, you know, I want to hug my dog, even though we're struggling to get away, but I love you. So I will hug you no matter what. It's like, no, that's not good. Once yeah. again, our selfishness. Mm -hmm. It is. Selfishness. Yeah. And, and kind of not understanding that their nature is so very different than human nature. That what they, what they want to need in life is not what we want to need. And you think, well, I would like it if somebody hugged me. It's like, well, maybe you would, but you know, it's it's still not. That's not what your dog is thinking, and that's not what that puppy is feeling. You know, if you're letting your kid hug them, they're not thinking that. They're thinking about biting your kid in the face. So stop doing that. People are always disappointed when they find out that you can't hold a sloth, and so I usually have to talk about how sloths are very different. They don't wild animals, whether they're born in captivity or not, they don't want to be held. They don't also yeah. also be hugged. They don't want to be the snuggled. They don't. That's not what the boss wants to do. Hi. You know. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, we get the public starting to come in. That let me um, our hour is up, and Deb and Amanda, I can't thank you both. Are so so.
There's oh, no. <laughs> She's just standing here just waiting for somebody. And she, she does like to be touched, but. <laughs> sure. I want to um, thank you both for coming on. Um, oh, thank you. Happy and, to be here. Yeah. And hope you have a great holiday season, Deb. And before everybody leaves, I just wanted to mention um, a couple of things. If you like the content that you've seen in this live stream, feel free to go to our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. There you will find our level one, level two memberships. Level one is for people wanting to work more with companion animals. Level two, uh, people working with professionals. Um, in the professional community, uh, we have professional trainers in there. Uh, we have uh, board certified. I'm in level two. Yay, Deb's in level two. And I'm getting ready to upload our um, podcast with Dr. Evelyn Gould from Harvard Medical Center on anxiety. Our podcasts are huge in our level one and level two membership. Um, we also have species specifics. Uh, we call them our projects. Our parrot project is very large and successful. Also, don't forget, you can purchase some of these things um, for gifts. It's five days before Christmas. Um, you can purchase gift certificates for our online memberships, projects, webinars, um, consultations, our training packages. Um, I'm going to skip over the rest of everything and try not to be salesy and just say, thank you. <laughs> it's hard for me to be salesy sometimes. Um, so thank you. Happy holidays to everybody. Um, Deb, I miss you. Um, no, I miss you so much. Seeing you makes it worse. It's like, oh, yeah, I really do miss you. So soon yeah. we'll, we'll be getting together again soon. I, I have no doubt. Yeah, we'll have absolutely. Some and thank you for joining today, Amanda. Well, it was fun I to be here. All right. Well, I'll let you go. Deb, have a All great right. Christmas. You too. Happy right. holidays, everybody. See you, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye, Deb. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.